back to Dragonstorm, ancient myth, legends, and lore. Sorry the show is a little later than we hoped. We, we would like to get one out every week, but with Christmas and the holidays, we are uh, running a little behind. Plus, we both got COVID, so I'm sorry about that. Like, We're going to try to get one show a week, roughly, hopefully. But um, while, before we get started on that, we would like to, Anthony would like to um, announce the winner of the drawing, uh, the contest. We have this... Uh, monthly riddle uh, contest, the the Dragon Storm. It's, it's kind of related to his book series, but we do like a, put a riddle out there like a, well, it's a riddle, you know. And it's a you riddle. Figure it out, you win a cool prize. Tell them, Anthony, what they want. Who won? Yeah, so uh, for, the, for the month of December, uh, it was a very interesting riddle, and um, uh, I actually got a lot of correct answers, which I was very happy. It was the Nazca lines, um, which are the ancient lines that um, – were done hundreds of years ago that can be seen from only from the sky, which makes them unique in and of themselves because back then no one was flying above to see uh, how the work was being done. So it's a, it's an interesting uh, area yeah, that I'm sure we're going to discuss. Of mine, just for the record, is to go to Peru mm -hmm. and, and see Machu Picchu with the Nazca lines. I just, I, someday I can't wait. Maybe I can go with you, Anthony. It would be no be person great. I'd rather love to go with than you. That would be super exciting. Dude from the air, too, hike in there. But whatever. So why don't you read the riddle and then, then answer it and then announce the winner? Okay, well, that one, then, uh, you're going to have to give me one second, because <laughs> I don't have it right in front of me. You don't remember the riddle? Yeah. You, you wrote the riddle. No, I, don't I wrote the I don't remember any of it. <laughs> <laughs> Even it real. All right, so then just give me one second. I'm sorry, but, uh, yes, I will get to the riddle very quickly, because I just had it open, hopefully. Your am I, am, I, turning, am I turning red? Does my face look red? <laughs> uh, a little bit, but your, the camera seems out of focus. I don't know if it's your camera or if it's the connection. You keep I think out. it must be the connection there, yeah. Well, so. they can still see you. You're handsome. Yeah, thanks, man. All right, so we were at the... How are you feeling state. after the COVID? Um, it took a while. I mean, and it's still, you know, it's Dude, lagging it's on a little bit, right? I mean, it takes yeah. a while to get out of a system. All right. I don't want to talk about COVID. I'm sure you don't want to either. So let's let's read the riddle. So if a bird am I, then a bird am I, spelled E-Y-E, a pebbled line of spider's design for 2,000 years, the monkey has rode upon the back of the whale over desolate plains where only flying remains for the land's lost masters who have woven this tale. And um, it was a very um, uh, out there kind of riddle. I'm sure it took some Googling and some searching and stuff, but um, the winner um, for this month receives this really cool, um, it's a real Death's Head moth from like Silence of the Lambs and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a really cool uh, a specimen to have. Um, so, and we did a random draw and our winner is Patrick Crown. So, Patrick, um, if you're listening to this, you will receive an email if you haven't received one already, um, requesting a mailing address, and you will get the uh, the Death's Head Moth, and you will also, I'm sure, get a bunch of other good stuff that Alexander Storm throws in that box for you, um, probably a book and some t-shirt and stuff like that, Very so cool, man. look forward to Very that. Cool. You guys, every month, man, get in and then, I, I, I'm kind of shocked that I didn't figure it out quicker, because um, I'm not a riddle guy, but... I should have connected the line to the monkey. It just, but uh, some people are smarter than me and they, they figured it out, man. It's a lot of people got it though. Didn't they? Yeah. I think I've got about 110, um, correct, uh, um, um, submissions. I got about 500 submissions overall. And I think about 110 got them right. So, and um, that and I, has a, a cameo in the book too, right? Oh yeah. A little, little bit here and there, you know, I tried to do uh, everything that I'm doing as prizes, which this month's prize is really cool. I'm just going to show quick. It's a uh, it's an actual crusade from the Fourth Crusade. It's a coin that was minted from the Fourth Crusade oh, during the time. Badass. Yeah. So this and can I get a little bit closer? Oh, that's so cool. I want that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. There cool you go. Nice and perfect. Yeah. yeah. So basically, this is when the Pope when when the time when the
and yeah. forward slash contest. And then you'll see this month's riddle and uh, and give it a shot. If you do some research, I'm sure you'll be able to answer it. Well, as somebody who's a former coin collector, yes, I'm that kind of nerd. Um, so I'll prove it every time I open my mouth these days. But when I was a kid, I was a coin collector. <laughs> and I believe it or not, I was aware of that monetary money. Um, you know, because you're collecting coins, you read and stuff. But I do remember vaguely hearing about that. And it's a very cool thing to have. It's not common. It's got no. value. I mean, it's something that's really cool, a collectible. So kudos to you for, for digging in there and uh, pulling a cool, rare treasure out that people can have. Something they can collect and pass down to their kid. And very cool. So Very cool. Back to, uh, so what we, we, we got a lot of people, I want to say submissions, but people commenting in the comments or emailing us saying, do a show about this or do a show about that. And there's all kinds of topics. And of course, now that I've been nerding out on these subjects, I'm going, I'm like subscribing to YouTube channels and, and I see all these cool like myths and legends and things. So we have so much, but we kind of decided uh, with the first show, we're going to stick with um, ancient Egypt, just kind of you know, do one or two, maybe three shows, and then we'll jump into something else. And there's so many cool things. But I will say this, if you are listening or watching this, and you have a, a myth or a legend that you've heard about or know about or want to know about, drop in the comments and say, and then we'll check it out. If it's real interesting or cool, we're like, yeah, we'll do that, man. We'll look it up. Me and Anthony, look, Anthony's the research guy. I'm just kind of the guy who nerds out on it. But still, he really enjoys the research. And he's super, you know, smart when it comes to these things. It's very natural. So We'll have some fun with you know future shows. For now, we're going to talk about ancient Egypt again because there's so much to ancient Egypt. Last show we talked about King Tut, who's a fascinating character. But the more Anthony talked, like the less fascinating I thought he was. You know what I'm saying? Even though he's fascinating, he really wasn't that unique and fascinating. So there's a lot more things that are unique uh, about that era and time in Egypt. Some really like almost mystical legends that you know no explanation for. But one of them is the Sphinx, but I'll let you lead the ship. Uh, where, what, where did you want to start? I have my show notes. You got the Sphinx. Where, there's the argument. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny because it, um, I had actually read an article um, in between the two shows that was very interesting um, about King Tut, and I just I wanted to bring it up. And it's so funny because you actually led me into it with – you didn't seem that remarkable anymore after we did our you know a little bit of talk about him. So there's a whole new theory now that based upon his armor that was found because what what happened is there were so many items that were discovered and a lot of it was just cataloged and pushed away you know it wasn't the grandeur of the gold items it wasn't all the you know the things that we've become familiar with from king touch tomb so what has happened is because there's the new museum that's opened in uh, in egypt all of uh carter's um uh, inventory stuff from from the tomb has really been laid out and is really being studied. And that's one of the things we will talk about later on. But I did want to mention because the armor that they found for King Tut was not a non-active warrior's armor. So what they were saying is this was armor that was made for someone who was fighting. It wasn't comfortable. It wasn't easy to wear. It, and it was done in such a degree that it was done in almost like scales yeah. Um, to stop, you know, the, the enemy's swords I've or spears. Seen I've seen the pictures. Do we, do we have a picture uh, happen to be queued up or no? If not, we'll get one. No, no. I, yeah, we'll definitely st uh, put one up there because there's actually some really new pictures that just came out uh, over the past few weeks where they were doing some really um, fine detail of even what holds the scales together and stuff yeah. um, that made them extremely strong. And um, based upon this and the wear and tear on the armor itself, the theory is if it was truly his armor and not uh, armor that they supplanted from a general or something like that, right. that he was actually a very active soldier and that maybe he was getting um, the wrong end of the, uh, the blade uh, pun intended because everyone was saying he was kind of like a, a deformed, probably not too active. Um, but from this new evidence and they're saying that he may have died actually in battle because there's the mystery of the head wound on the mummy and stuff. So now we've come we've come full, full circle to someone who may have been a pretty great warrior who died young because he was out, you know, on the front line in Egypt's battles. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. And it really puts a whole a, a never ending, changing twist, you know, on on Egypt. Yeah. So maybe his his malformities and stuff weren't malformities birth wise. Maybe he was injured in battle and like sure. or something, you know what I'm saying? 
back right, then. right, yeah. Back then, when you got injured, they didn't put you back together perfectly, man. You you, you could heal up and be all messed up, and, right? You know, who knows? Right, yeah, wired bones and things like that. And some of those things they had actually believed were from attempts at medical um, procedures on him. May have been exactly what you just said. May have been repairs from from battle injuries. Um, you know, at a very young age, he may have been in battle at you know. 16 17 18 years old um you know as a soldier he was out there on the front lines when he was 16 17 years old oh yeah alexander kicked butt yeah alexander kicked butt that's for sure Um, i definitely want to talk about him one day yeah yeah down the road we'll do a whole show on alexander the great because there's a lot of legends that follow him too some true some not some we don't know but truly a remarkable character of antiquity amazing one of them one of them really remarkable dudes but so that, thanks for that. I appreciate that. Now, yeah, uh, a, little update. Have a whole new kind of outlook on King Tut. I literally <laughs> thought he was kind of like this male form kind of weird kid who didn't really do anything. Right. And now, this dude might have been a badass out there in the front lines, killing and pillaging, I'm just saying. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so, the Sphinx. The, the Sphinx, argument. yeah. Now, the Sphinx like, is, the is a... Is a- so the Sphinx is, is an anomaly because it's placed here at the three great pyramids in Giza on the plateau. Um, but most scholars agree that it probably wasn't built at the same time as the great pyramids. Um, and the reason that, that they believe that is because of carbon dating and things like that is also, if you look at the Sphinx from aerial views and stuff, um, which, you know, we have some that we're going to show. But if you have some of those views, you see that the head really is not in proper um, proportions to the body. And everything that they did was with such perfection. I don't think that that's by chance or by accident. So it looks like what you probably had there was a lion's head originally. um, And one of the pharaohs had it uh, carved down um, into the pharaoh's face and created the first probably sphinx. Um, and that probably led to the creation of all the other Sphinx that you see in Egypt was this, this first, um, you know, forming of the, of the, um, of the lion. It, oh, there's thousands and thousands of them from but small how many ones. Big ones like that, though, the, uh, oh, it's the only great one like that. Yeah. yeah okay, it's the only right. great one like that. So the really, the really mysterious, well, there's a lot of mysterious things about the Sphinx. Um, that being the primary, now we start to fall into issues of the dating of the Sphinx, um, erosion and eroding marks on the body of the Sphinx are more common to jungle climate. Okay. And there was a time when Egypt was a jungle, was the rainforest. Um, but it, you know, of course we know it as an arid desert right now. So basically, um, at the time that it was a jungle, you're looking at 12,000 years ago versus three or 4,000 years. Uh, so you're about six. So if we said that uh, the average um, belief is it's somewhere about 5,000 years old from yeah. today, you actually would have to go back another 8,000 years per se to get to that climate where you would see that type of erosion. Well, here, so now we yeah. ask ourselves. I got one thing that you have to consider too. Uh, it's it's by the Nile, right? So, and the, those giant rivers did cha- tend to change and move. So wherever the river went, so did the jungle. So sometimes, you know, the flood it would go over here, and it could move miles, miles. So over a thousand years, the river could move, you know, a hundred miles or something. You know, at times, you know, all over the place. See, so and wherever it went, the jungle followed because of the water. So that's a theory, anyways. Sure. Yeah, but we're to- we're talking about a time period where all that is desert right now was jungle. This was rainforest and jungle. There wasn't there wasn't desert when you go back that far. The climate was that different. Oh, really? Um, yeah. So yeah, you're talking about a structure that was built. I mean, think about it. Twelve thousand years ago is a big difference between oh, yeah. uh, when we think yeah. around. And so now you talk about things like the tools that were used. Um, you know, the knowledge of certain astro- uh, astrological alignments and things like that. Now you have to predate uh, where we thought a lot of the first technology had occurred. You really, that's why it becomes such an anomaly because yeah, now. Mean, that's pretty bronze you know, age, man. That's, that, that's the thing oh, about yeah. it. 12,000 years. If, 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 to put this in perspective, just so people who don't, maybe not know, are aware of the history of humanity and the timeline, 
12,000 years ago, basically we were just coming out of caves, you know, Correct. the rest of the world, the, you know what I'm saying? The rest of the world, well, parts of it anyways, but right. like the, the first Indians and stuff like that in North America and Central America at the time, but 12,000 years ago, we were not advanced as a, as a no. society. No. And I don't think we were even organized, uh, if my if my recollection is right, into like farming and things like right. that. There was yeah. nothing like that. It was That's roaming, that. stay alive, you know, kind of, uh, you know, Two life. Clans, little right. clans and pockets of people here and there. No, That's farming it. came in around 10,000. And I believe the, the first farming that they can trace back. Was well, some of it in the Middle East, but I think it's more like going you know, going into like France and and like uh, the European areas where they discovered people were farming and stuff. Right, like they, very early on agriculture. But back twelve thousand years ago, I mean, you have no technology. I mean, this no. is pre Bronze Age. You were running around with a spear. <laughs> yeah, was, right. What is the Bronze Age? What is starts about twelve thousand years ago? Uh, I think it's I think it's less than that. I think it's like you're saying. I think it's about nine thousand or ten thousand. I'm sure somebody will correct us. <laughs> but still, I mean, just think yeah. about now, now. Now, and think about the technology that was evolved to build something or create and construct something like the Sphinx. Not only the technology, which is absolutely remarkable if you think about it, but the manpower. I mean, you had you would have to organize an organize, entire yeah. society. And people don't work for free. You know what I'm saying? Right. They got to eat. They got to drink. They got to live. They got to use the bathroom. You're talking a thousand guys uh, building something over like, you know, a couple of years, right? Sure. I mean, yeah. I mean, depending on the level of tools and technology, it could take, you know, it could take years and years for a group of people. And the organization part is a, is a big part of it. So you're talking about having an organized group. So you're talking about some type of a governmental regime right that yeah. can organize and and put this together and pay like you said and, and there be a reason why yeah. um you know and so that that is one of the uh the big you know uh sphinx mysteries well, they um, did worship, didn't they worship uh like like cats were a big deal to to the egyptian absolutely uh, yeah there's a story that. behind that too but i'm just like i have a feeling that you know you look at churches today and like some of the most incredible cathedrals and, and churches that were ever built were built in the name of Christ. Hard workers, guys would go to work every day, all day for years to build this cathedral or church or whatever in Rome. Or whatever. So if you're motivated by like spiritual, you know, reward, meaning like they, they, they believe that they're building a, a, an idol to the God or maybe not an idol, but that's something to worship their God. That, that was likely the purpose of the Sphinx, right? They worship cats and sure. what was the I mean if lions were if lions were one of the uh, one of the most dangerous predators that they faced then maybe they were building this to appease the the yeah. you know the supreme lion so that they would eat less of the natives that you know <laughs> that's probably what they were thinking yeah. at the it time was the, supreme, the most dangerous animal in Africa at the time was a lion now I'm saying it's not more less dangerous than a rhinoceros or a, a hippo or a or a black mamba or even a cape buffalo that kill more people than lions but in that society and time, the most dangerous thing that you could encounter was a lion. So was maybe lion, they sure. what was it, what maybe they was uh, you know kind of dedicated to the lions and just to say like we worship you. We know you're the baddest mother ever on the plains. You know if all you got imagine if all you have is a stick, maybe a spear, yeah. but probably a stick with us. Would I like a rock like an arrowhead type thing on it for your weapon? And you are encountered a lion. Lions will kill you instantly. Like they see you <laughs> as, a, as a morsel. They don't yep. even say, eh. no, of course, lions today, they're, they're kind of a natural fear of humans a little bit. They're more scared of humans. Back then, they see a, a human, that's dinner. They don't even think. Right. So, prey just like any other type of animal, right? I mean, it really was. It. Easy prey. We are, humans easy. are weak. We can't run fast. We're not, you know, yeah. we can't, I mean, dude, like if a, a human is very easy to kill. So for a lion, this is the easy dinner. And it's not easy like having dinner. to take down a buffalo or something. We're, no, we're weak. This is fast food, right? Fast food, yeah. <laughs> so, what are some other of the theories on the Sphinx? And also, is there like a there's a chamber inside of it, though, right? Yeah, well, that's where I was going. There's a couple of different entry points, um, and I think we'll be able to post some video in the final product here of some of those entry points. Um, it's very guarded and secretive um, from the Egyptian government and from the uh, Department of Antiquities. There is definitely, um, through the use of seismic um, um, imaging um, type machinery, there are large chambers underneath the Sphinx. And I, I call them chambers. I don't know what else to call them there. They're architect 
architected um, um, spaces below the Sphinx where there's a void of, of ground. So um, I believe it is chambers. I think a lot of people at, at this point believe there are chambers down there. Um, there are some entry points on the sides right behind the long paws where you can actually walk right up to if you visit the Sphinx and you can get up close and kind of look and it goes down and there's ladders that go down. So there is space and there is stuff down underneath the Sphinx. The theories about spreading out all the way to the pyramid is is something that I have heard before, that there's underground chambers that lead from the Great Pyramid to the Sphinx. The Sphinx may have been an entry point at one time that led maybe stairs between the paws that led down into a chamber that led into the area within the pyramid that we can't get to, let's say the center of the pyramid, um, you know, which we really have no imaging for and you, we can't know what's there. Um, you know, um, that's it's one of the mysteries. They haven't pyramid. done the seismic imaging. Like I know how they send radio waves through and what it bounces off and all that. Have they done that type of, um, you know, scanning and imagery of the, the pyramids or is it too yeah. dense? Can they get through it's it? Too dense. It's too dense. They really can't get too far in. Um, you know, we're not dealing with, with, um, you're not dealing with uh, gravel and dirt and ground that they're able yeah. to get some basic imaging from. You're dealing with solid stone, and there's only so oh, far cool. down that they can go. Um, you know, and if we're talking about centered in the in the center of the Great Pyramid, it's way too far in to get any kind of imaging. That would be pretty cool if they made like the the secret escape or something, the Sphinx or or entrance. Yeah. Like the only way in is go through the Sphinx, and it goes 500 yards over to the the middle of the thing. And I mean, I don't put nothing past the Egyptians. That's for sure. I will say no. this. They were so far ad more advanced technologically than the rest of the world, which we can get into this in a second, uh, uh, kind of leads me to believe that they were encouraged or, or, or influenced by angels, God, um, aliens, whatever you want to call it. Because how, how did somebody, and let's take it back 12,000 years, but even if it wasn't, 5,000, I mean, how the hell did they have the technology and the, the the measuring capabilities, the cutting capabilities, and the movement to move those resources, those giant rocks. Some of those rocks had come from other parts of Africa, right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. They were they, they were brought from different quarries that were very far away from where they were. You know, in this theory, they floated them down the Nile, and you know, these things are these you know hundreds of tons of, of stone. In fact, there's there is one at the Sphinx. Um, another thing that I was just I had never I had never seen it before in all my research, and it was just the other night while I was doing some research for this. There is a a, a stone that they um, guess weighs about forty tons that slid in perpendicular. Um, so if the pyramid's like this, it's kind of slid in this way underneath the legs, and it's it's an architected stone, and by that I mean it's cut. It has different kinds of grooves and stuff in it. Then it has other stones that are inlaid into it. And there's, yeah. it's there for some purpose. No one knows it's what it could be. It's not on the exterior. Yeah, it's on the interior. So it's not meant for decorative or something that's done on the outside. It is something that is done on the inside of the Sphinx. And again, no one has any idea what this piece of, of massive stone that comes from a quarry 100 miles away or whatever is doing there and why it is architected the way that it is and, and designed the way that it is. Um, it's just another one of the mysteries. Yeah, um, that's remarkable. I, of when the I saw in that, the area. I remember seeing that thinking to myself, why would they do that? Cause that's a lot of freaking work cutting it to perfection, but then you got to right. get the other rocks on top of it to fit perfect too. You got to cut them. But I'm thinking maybe in their engineering, you know, prowess that they're like, that was like a cornerstone of some kind. And to thwart seismic movement or a flood or whatever, they made it so it like it was almost like a key, you know, where it locks everything together. This is my theory. I, I am right, right. Else. Maybe it's so, a key to open everything up. <laughs> that's all of our dreams, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> Boom. And that's funny. And in the front of the the, the Sphinx is a great story. It's uh, it's called. It's about the Dream Stella. A Stella is um, and you've all seen them. It's this. It's a half oval stone tablet almost like what you would see as the ten commandments that's called the yeah. stella or stila in in egypt um and it, this is the story of the dream stella and what it was was tutmosis the i think it's the fourth um he was experiencing a tremendous amount of drought and famine and the the, the country was in ruin and um he went and he fell asleep between the paws of the great sphinx 
And at the time, the pyramids, believe it or not, and the Sphinx were covered with sand and, and old already. So you're probably talking about if we if we take the date of the Great Pyramid as being real, you're talking probably about 2000 years after the pyramids were built. This is another pharaoh in Egypt. So it's so that the, the pyramids are old to him already, too. Um, sure. So he fell asleep uh, between the paws of the Great Sphinx and he had a dream. And the Sphinx told him, if you clear me away and make me great again and, and the grandeur of what I am, I will bring prosperity back to Egypt. Um, so when he woke up, he decided that this was uh, the final project of a, of a failing kingdom. And he brought people in and they, they cleared away all the sand. They restored the Sphinx and they did all this. And then uh, it is said that immediately, um, you know, the land became prosperous again, food and water and rain and all those type of things came. So he built what's called the Dream Stella. And actually, Tutmosis actually put that between the legs of the Sphinx to tell of this great tale. And that's still there today um, from Tutmosis IV, I believe. Is so it, I thought that was a nice story. That is cool. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I didn't know that. But is it, is it, is like it's on display for all the world or is it actually part of the foundation of the Sphinx? Or yeah. If you, not? it's, it's there. He built it into the Sphinx. So the yeah. stones. So I guess when they were probably reinforcing, uh, it's built right in. So you can find pictures of it online easy. Um, just look up Dream Stella at Sphinx. Tell you what it is? Yeah. Yeah. And it, it tells the story of Cuthmosis falling asleep. And uh, and being visited by the Sphinx in his dream, and uh, and being you know told if you want to become great again, you need to make me great again. Clear away all the sand and debris, and rebuild me and make me great again. So, uh, like, you know that's uh, why since then the, the Sphinx has remained, you yeah, know, cleared and intact. Yeah. yeah. Kind of like the Iliad and the Odyssey, yeah, Lotus Land. If you remember the you know, Iliad and the Odyssey, but mm -hmm. anyways, he he falls asleep and. And then he enters a whole different world and can't get back out because he's so he's so deep into this dream world that he doesn't even want to come back. You know what I'm saying? It's a, you know, right, it's right. A Greek myth, but uh, yeah, nerdy stuff. But nerdy stuff. Good cool. stuff. I um, I, it makes me just want to go see it, man. You know, but it's like if I go to see it with you, for example, I I I, I want someone like you to kind of help me and 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 break this all down for me. But the problem is, it's very, um, I don't know, touristy, you know? You go there, and there's probably tourists from all over the world everywhere. And what I want to know is, would they let me climb up on the pyramid? Ah, uh, yeah. Well, that's one that uh, it's kind of back and forth. That's going to be a who you know. Um, right. It I used to be going. common. It used to be very common. Uh, people used to go to the top climb for, uh, for New Year's Eve. It was actually a big thing for New Year's Eve. To you know the changing of the of the clock on the top of the Great Pyramid, um, and climbing it, and climbing it is a, is a, apparently a task in and of itself. It's no joke, sure. um, but uh, I think that you can um, if you get the proper permissions. I don't think you yeah, can just yeah. walk up to the pyramid anymore and just start climbing up on it. Um, I imagine that they're fearful of you know people getting hurt and suing. Sure erosion because here's the thing suing you know, Osiris <laughs> I've, I've climbed up like mountains on the side of mountains and and there's trails going up even in the rocks and all that it, the, if you get thousands of people climbing up something it's going to erode the surface um sure. so yeah let, let every, if you let everybody who wanted to climb the pyramid go up the pyramid you know in a couple hundred years you're going to have a trail going up the pyramid and you're going to sure. ruin the sanctity of the pyramid so naturally i get it so you got to be somebody who's kind of famous or rich or know the right people and because i would love to go up to the top of the pyramid and like get a selfie <laughs> You know, yeah, man. you and me so, both. Yeah, we <laughs> would love a, to do it. We get a couple movies made, and we'll have some juice. I remember yeah. there's a movie called Jumpers. Do you remember the movie Jumpers? Oh, with it, that they time jumped, right? They were. I, I'm not sure if it was time, but they could jump anywhere in the anywhere in the world. Okay, one yeah. To another, and at one point, like he was trying to impress this girl. So, like, if he was touching her, and he could jump to where he wanted to go, and he's like, you know, she's like, I want to see the pyramid. Just like, poof, and they're on top of the pyramid. Like they were really on. So, <laughs> yeah. I think it was um uh I can't think of that name. The actor is uh Jonah something and all. I think anyways Noah Hill Jonah Hill, not Jonah Hill maybe it was. Oh anyways he was a heartthrob and all the girls liked him. But I remember thinking dude that would be cool as hell to get up on top of the pyramid and just, absolutely like, get the pictures and but there's so much to see there too. 
it's not just a pyramid. Of course, we all want to go check out the pyramids, but just like not far from the, the, the giant, the main pyramid, there's a bunch of other pyramids. There's all kinds of ruins. There's, there's that, that one, like, I don't know the name of it, you will, but it's almost like an amphitheater built in the side of a side of a mountain. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. You, port I, up there. Abu Simbel is the one that they moved. Um, UNESCO moved yeah. Abu Simbel. Yes. Yeah, because they when they dammed up the when they dammed up the river, the yeah. water was gonna so can you imagine in the sixties, I think it was the end of the fifties and the sixties, this was a massive undertaking. They were slicing these great stone monuments yeah. with you know, Moving with them. saws, lifting them and they moved the entire thing back, I don't know, maybe two or three hundred yards away from the from the edge of the Nile. Um, I mean, and that was in like the sixties and that's amazing in and of itself, I think, but yeah, Abu yeah. Simbel's beautiful. I actually have a picture of it behind me. I don't know if you can see it back there, but it's somewhere back there. Yeah. Um, yeah. that's another place. Yeah. But they did a lot of, they did a lot of movement when they dammed up the river. Um, and there's when they still did. some things that they didn't save. I know that I would read about that. There's some things that they didn't save and ended up underwater, but they, yep. there was also a couple things. Well, just a quick side story, but didn't the um was it Iran or, or or Iraq? I can't remember, but there was like some ancient, like really beautiful uh, statues built into the sides of walls or whatever, and the Muslims they went and blew them all up because they were represented Christian or Jew Judaism or whatever. Do you, you know what I'm talking about? I think so. There was a lot. Are you talking about during that ISIS uh, when they were destroying a lot of the um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And stuff? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they really did a number on Egypt itself. And I know a lot of the other surrounding lands. Yeah, they did the, um, what is that, the Assyrian, right? And, um, yeah. you know, uh, the old. Uh, Destroyed um, all these yeah. things. It's just like. Yeah, they, and they had sphinxes there. and stuff like that, too, that, that were, you know, great stone sphinxes with the bearded, um, you know, the. Uh, mm -hmm the Assyrian figures and stuff. Um, yeah, a lot of that stuff got, got destroyed or, or damaged and ruined, but, um, That's horrible, man. yeah. So, so I, I don't have my show notes. Um, I want to talk about the iron, uh, the iron dagger. of King. Oh yeah. That was kind of, that's pretty new too. And that goes back to King Todd. That's why I said we'd go back to him again. So one of the, the really interesting things that was buried with King Todd was this dagger um and iron was um they were a couple of years away from the the because there wasn't a big um uh, uh mining of iron in the area so um the smelting of iron and things like that really hadn't occurred too much within egypt so it was actually probably much more rare than gold uh, to have iron um and king tut had this really um great long dagger uh, almost of a sword's length and it was uh of an iron consistency and um, all these years, we've wondered about this uh, this iron dagger, where it might have come from, was it a gift, and so on and so forth. Just recently, and again, it was because they were doing all this recataloging and reevaluation of everything that was in his tomb, they did um, an x-ray type test where they're able to actually pull apart the elements of the iron itself. Um, and what they found is that the, I think it was the cobalt level that was super high and it represented an iron, uh, composite iron that isn't found anywhere on the earth at all. So what? immediately, where do they go to? Yeah. So it's actually, it's made from the smelting of uh, a meteorite um, with a high uh, concentration of iron and cobalt in it. So King Tut's uh, um, dagger that was buried with him is actually from the stars um, and is of iron from somewhere out in the universe that found its way here um, was recognized as something that could be turned into a, a, a solid piece of metal and they made him this dagger um, and why it was so important to him is very obvious now it was you know it came from the sky from the stars from the gods you know oh my god yeah wow. and that's amazing you know the yeah. uh, you know you you hear stories about things or legends as we were growing up um we're about the same age and it's all it's I think a lot of adults um, through the years kind of just put things aside as they get older, aliens or supernatural and things like that. Um, as our technology advances and we're able to really delve into both the culture and the actual physical things we've been able to find, it, it almost takes on a real supernatural, um, um, you know, Feel. realm to all of this. 
I mean, his his dagger was made from a meteorite. I mean, that's you know. I mean, like yeah. you said, and they recognize that this is not you know. I mean, somebody in his like camp said this found probably a, where a meteor had hit, and there's a half burnt, busted up chunk of like rock slash iron. Maybe they didn't know it was from the space, but maybe they did. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Whatever the case is. Or maybe it was intentional. Maybe they were communicating with whoever sent it. And maybe whoever sent it said, you make this. And they throw it to him or give it to him or deliver sure. it to him and say, make his spear out of this. I mean, it's no, it's it's unearthly. It's otherworldly. They thought, what are the odds that he's going to make a King Tut, his, his, this, the Sphinx and the King of Egypt, is going to make a spear out of a otherworldly metal and have the only one on the planet it's just it's amazing on, man. yeah it doesn't make any sense yeah it's amazing well do you what do you think i want to ask ask you like what you've reported on it just now mm -hmm. but what is your opinion on all of this you know getting we're wrapping it up it's just for the day's show and there's more i talk all day but i just kind of like you've researched it and thought it out studied it and what is your theory and don't be afraid to offend somebody you know um oh. no i'm a christian but i still here's the thing i'm a christian but i believe in evolution so most people who, who are true christians will like well you can't be a christian and believe in evolution well here let me give you my reasoning for that just quickly if you go through the bible in genesis and it says god created the world in seven days right First day was everything coalesced. Second day, you know, formed the gas. Third day was the water. And fourth day was the animals of the water. Fifth day was animals, uh, the reptiles and creatures. Sixth day was the animals across the land. Basically, in the Bible, it describes the exact process of evolution. Evolution, correct. Exactly, to the T. So the Bible says, but it's saying, it's used metaphorically saying one day. But let's say Earth is almost 7 billion years old. So maybe one day to god it was a billion years so sure. if you break it into that if you say every day god is saying because here's the thing the people who are going to be reading it including today god knew that nobody could wrap their mind especially until recently around billions of years you're gonna say since one billion years i did this and this is how evolution happened with the <laughs> gases and formulating with gravity and pulling it Nobody's going to understand that. These are people who are very simple people who are first reading this stuff. So God kind of explained it in a very clear and metaphoric way. Seven days. I built it in a week. They one, day two, two, two. But if you go through the process, you're like, he explained evolution to the T. So therefore, in my mind, I believe God created the heavens and earth in seven days, but each day was a billion years. And evolution, you know, was, is real. It's also Christian. So I don't. I care to offend some people. I've had arguments with people who are like, you know, who've written books and stuff about it. You know, people have been on my show like, you can't be a Christian and believe that. I mean, if you believe the world was, here's what they believe. They believe the world was created in uh, 6,000 years. And, but what about all the carbon data uh, that we have based on, you know, it's, they're like, it's, oh, it's all fake. They say it's fake. None of it's real. No. It's not accurate. It's a very difficult argument to have science and religion the two don't mesh and i think that that's probably the most intelligent stand that you can take regarding all of this is that science and religion don't mess don't mesh together and if you just accept that um i think it allows you to decide what you want to accept as scientific proof and what you want to accept on faith and i think if you allow yourself to be like that because if you ask me, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter to me whether it was evolution or whether it was God in six days. Because you know what? Like you said, I'm here for X amount of years and then it doesn't matter to me anyway, you know, right? You know. So, right. So, really, to try to, ha to even waste time having an argument about which is right is just a waste of time to me. Uh, there's, there's the scientific standpoint, there's the religious standpoint. The two can't mesh because they don't work. Uh, one is, uh, you know, like I said, a lot of faith on based on faith. Do, though, there's a lot of Christian scientists today who are now starting to go. Well, this evolutionary thing looks like you know, but the but they're also looking at the spiritual thing, and so I think there are a handful of scientists who are Christian or whatever. But again, God, it's like saying to this, like uh, we are ants compared to God. God just gave us as much knowledge as He wants us to have for now, right? 
but we if I had if I take an ant and stick it on front of this computer and say, you know, I figure out my MacBook, he'll never figure it out. That's kind of how I did with us. So right. it's not we are not designed to understand the majesty of God and what he created, whether it be evolution, whether it be just um paranormal, just poof in the reality. We're not designed to understand it. We can theorize and we can speculate, but whatever the case is, I'm just curious about your opinion. If well, I had to ask, if somebody if somebody said to me, Gunner, your life is on the line, and I need an answer, definitive answer. Do you believe that what they did in Egypt, whether it be five thousand or twelve thousand years ago, was all man? Was it man and God? Was it God or was it aliens? I would say, based on mathematical probabilities, if you look at the universe and how big it is, just look at our one galaxy, eight hundred billion stars. I would say aliens. I would say aliens came to Earth and were somehow integrated into our society and helped them advance. Maybe gave us a, so they weren't here to eat us or kill us or take us over. They just said, "Hey, listen, very this is a very primitive uh, organism, life form on Earth. Uh, I don't want to hurt them, but I'll give them some knowledge and things and put them on their way." And ultimately, it led us to where we are right now, where we're you know across the country having a conversation via video, sure. whatever the case is. I think. I, if I had to guess, that's what I'd say. What do you think? I think there's definitely um, some type of intervention, whether it be from um, God yeah, or- from God, from some spiritual or supernatural entity. I think when I do my writing and I take a lot of these uh, these myths and legends, I like to. I'm not a big UFO kind of guy, so I like to go more towards the religious or supernatural, or you know. Um, you know, my, my bad guys are demons. They're not, you know, spacemen, let's say. So I, I do like the, the, um, that realm of, of explanation um, that's just for my own purposes I more. I, I agree. Just for the record, the probability or, or of that being possible is just as, you know, like, I don't know, mathematically, it's hard to, to, to quantify the spiritual realm and demons and all. But I would say, you know, it's just as probable that it was God, um, some kind of higher power, divine creation, creator, did it just as possibly aliens. I just kind of look at the math. It could be one and the same. It could be one and the same, right? Again, it's just just labeling. We're just labeling things, right? Right. I mean, a a power that we may say, um, because it doesn't fit the mold of what we say an alien is from movies and books. It, right. it's still a power from another realm within you know I- I eternity and infinity um so that can be probably either or it can be supernatural it could be you know oh. um, you know theological or it could be you know sci-fi it's it doesn't really matter it's something i agree something from somewhere intervened here we've taken too many big leaps um and we've forgotten more than we remember from the past. So um, there's, there was something that was definitely involved here. I, I think, you know, otherwise you just had some very, very extremely intelligent, um, you know, members of society for, you know, but that doesn't make like they say, you're shaking your head now because the probability of that is ridiculously low. Well, so not to mention if you, if you look around the world, you look to, you know, Mexico or in the South America, China, all these other places in the world, there's even Eastern Europe. There are certain like things that are built using similar technologies oh, yeah. around the same era. How did that happen? Oh yeah, the connections. That's one of the things I love. Yeah, the connections are are unexplainable. It, they're unexplainable. Um, you know, so, there was no no video conferencing. There was no way of getting this information to the other side of the earth at the same period of time to create the same things facing the same directions of the same design. It's just. Yeah. It's too much. It's too much of a of a coincidence, and I don't believe in coincidence. So uh, yeah, you know, something not only that, but the technology that was required. Maybe if you had some super, super savant, Da Vinci kind of uh, savant who could create things in one place, right. but you wouldn't have another guy that doing the same thing at the same time right. on the other side of the planet, and then have another guy doing it. It's just mathematically if you were if you're a pursuer mathematician and say okay give me the mathematic probabilities of this coincidence happening i would say it's probably infinite i don't know yeah. maybe I mean, it's probably a number you could put on it but it's, i just don't like you said there's no way quince i don't believe in quinces like that i believe that um there had to be either divine intervention um whether that was through the use of aliens and alien technology that we perceived as 
demons or, or, or angels or whatever, something changed the course of humanity those thousands of years ago. We don't know the exact number, but something changed the course of humanity. And ultimately, it led us to this moment where we are, you know, in a, uh, we like to think we're advanced, right? But to, to the minds of the, the people who came to Earth and showed them how to you know, use technology to make these things, we are still probably super, super primitive, man. Like mm -hmm. barely even, barely even worth recognizing as an intelligent life form primitive. Yep. As as we stand right now. So yep. imagine if we could evolve without killing our, ourselves, which I don't believe that'll happen. I think humanity will kill itself, um, whether it's a hundred years from now or a hundred thousand years from now. Uh, will create uh, some kind of catastrophic, probably war. There'll be a nuclear war. And everybody, the world will kill itself and then it'll go back to the feudal clans and it'll repopulate over the next million years or whatever. But I just think that um, at some point, now my wife is like you said, um, she thinks that the aliens are in fact demons or the demons are aliens or whatever the case. And right. so it's all going to come down to, in my opinion, what God is allowing. He created the universe, and obviously, if he created the entire universe, there's billions and billions and billions of solar systems just in our galaxy, man. And there's billions of galaxies, maybe trillions. Um, if he could create this one solar system with Earth and life, why wouldn't he do it um, a billion times or all oh, over the world? Yeah, no, I believe that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they're out there. So when when will they arrive? Mm -hmm. I mean, I watched the Tucker, Tucker Carlson the other day, a little clip of him. He was saying somebody was interviewing him. They said is there anything that you're not comfortable talking about? And he said, alien. He's like, because I've interviewed the, the area 51 or area 52, whatever it is. I've interviewed uh, agents, federal agents who worked in these, you know, acronyms. And he says, the things that they've showed me, they've showed me files, the things that they said, it's scary. He's like, I'm scared to even repeat it because I, you know, value my life and my family. So, wow. Who even, I mean, this is one of the most powerful people in the media in the world. Sure. To even, and he's a journalist. Scared to bring up something like this. Like, what does he know? You yeah. know what I'm saying? What What does he know that, that we don't know? You know? Have you ever heard some of those interviews? Like the one guy, he, he worked in Area 51 or 2, whatever it is. And uh, he, he, he said, this guy was very believable. And, and for somebody to be this emboldened and believable about a story that's this detailed, and he was an ex, like, uh, you know, he was a scientist who worked for NASA, and they recruited him, and they brought him in there to try and figure out, reverse engineer this technology, that they had a, they had a little flying saucer type thing that had crashed. And they kind of figured it out. Um, it, it, it could levitate. There was, like, this ball in the middle of it. There was, like, a little place where three aliens were sitting. They were all killed upon landing here because our, our atmosphere was, wasn't. Did you ever hear about that? Yeah, I mean, I've heard a lot of these stories, you know, and it's funny because it's probably a lot of the technology that's advanced. Our technology is probably yeah. bits and pieces of this stuff they've cleaned up from the from the crash sites. Uh, you know, that's a theory that, you know, cell phones and things like that, that nanotechnology that we took leaps and jumps and bounds that uh, that yeah, don't make logical years. sense again, that we just, you know, continue to make things smaller and be able to make things more powerful. Um, it seems to defy what we, you know, have been able to do before, you know. So, yeah, I'm sure a lot of that stuff is involved. And it's funny. I'm glad we talked a little bit about space and, and religion because I have a clip and I think we'll probably have to put it on at the end. And then maybe we'll you'll listen to it and I'll listen to it again. Um, it's of a black hole. And what they did is scientists have been able to take a radioscopic telescope type of a system and send it into the center of a black hole, however, a million light years away. And they've been able to catch an audio track of the audio emanating from the edge of the black hole. And um, it well, is... Sound can escape the gravity of a black hole, but light can't? Yeah, but you're going to listen to this and you're going to be disturbed and um, it's going to raise all kinds of questions about what you're listening to. It is it is amazingly disturbing to say the least. I don't. Well, I have. We'll I have right the track here. Yeah. We'll it in right here, and we'll play it for a moment. And uh, unless you want to play it out, if you can play it right now, and then um, hopefully it'll play in the yeah. video. Let's let's take a look. Let's see. 
I, I can't hear it. But maybe You're right. I think it's coming up. Yeah, I didn't even know because you know I know light can't escape the gravity of a black hole. There's a, there's a lot about right. black holes that that confuse me really. Um, you know, because the black hole is supposedly created by a you know supernova or a, a, a white dwarf and it implodes and but it's like there's 800 billion stars in our galaxy. That means we're going to end up with 800, 800 billion black holes at some point. I mean, I just there it is. There it goes. It came up. Did you see it? No. Yep. All right. Can you play the audio? Yeah. Black yep. holes are are wild, bro. The gravity of a black hole is so powerful that not even light can escape it. Now, if that's a black hole, the gases that you're seeing right. around it are millions and billions of stars. Like our solar system is somewhere in there. If that was, you know, oh, there it is. Oh, no. Our, our technical engineer is is experiencing difficulties. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to give up this job next time. <laughs> it says playing yeah. live, but I don't see it to you. Oh, we're going we're gonna to have to edit. We'll, we'll edit it in afterwards. I'll put it in after the fact. Yeah. Do my best. But, um, yeah, that's remarkable. What is the sound? I mean. It sounds like a billion screaming souls. Really? Yeah, it's really, it's really disturbing. And I, that's why really? I, I definitely, I definitely want you to clip it into the end of this. And then, and then it'll be the, I know it'll be the first thing we talk about on the next show. <laughs> well, we'll talk about that on the next show, guys. Um, yeah. And just think about it. It's almost like it, it's metaphoric if you think about it. You know, the billion screaming souls sucked into this. But where does it where 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 does it go when something is sucked into the black hole? You know, I'm talking about billions of stars circling around. You know, uh, they're rotating, orbiting, whatever you want to say. Billions of stars around this one dark, whatever it is, that is so dense that the gravity of which Light can't even escape it, and it's essentially sucking all of us into it. And eventually, all of us, every molecule on our body, will be sucked into a black hole someday. Sure. Uh, unless God intervenes. Um, and then, but where does it go? It pops out the other side, on the other side of the universe, or maybe it's another universe. I don't know. And Seven? I gar I guarantee you that we will never know. <laughs> you and I will never know. Maybe maybe after after we die, we might know. Um, if it's sure. God's will. If it's God's will. I think that one of the, the things uh, in the afterlife in heaven, uh, in my belief, is that these questions will be answered by God. And and maybe he'll even show us the answers and take us to them. Um, but I hope it's so. I hope where I can go, you know, what's the story behind a black hole? And he's like, well, here, let me show you. And uh, I think that would be pretty cool. That would be pretty cool. That would be cool. Well. That was another great show. Hope everybody enjoyed. I know that um, your connection was a little, you got fuzzy here and there, but I don't think anyone's going to mind because what mattered was your audio. Oh, geez. My, uh, oh. I think you jinxed yourself. Yeah, my, my <laughs> battery just died. Watch this. Mm. Uh, uh, I got uh, there you go. Now you're really adding the mood. This should have been the Halloween edition. <laughs> yeah, right? I can go get a video. I can get the thing, or I can just let it ride. What do you think? You want me to get another battery? We just No, it let it ride like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my, my lighting runs off a of battery. So anyways, but that's pretty cool. So everybody make sure that you, if you enjoy the show, drop a comment and ask us to talk about whatever. There's a million obscure little things. Obviously, you know, me and Tony are an expert. He's an expert. I'm not an expert or nothing, but he, but he's not an expert on everything. So if it's something kind of obscure, um, we take a little time, do some research and check it out, have some fun, and then we'll do a show on it. There's so much speculation with so many of these things, but we're pretty educated. We're pretty, you know, pretty smart dudes. So maybe we can uh, enlighten and have a good discussion about it and have some fun. Sure. For and now, give me new maybe. ideas. Give me new ideas for my books. That's where I take the yeah, ideas yeah. from. So give me some new stuff. Exactly. These, that's where, like, books like yours are always sparked by some kind of, uh, something. So, there's always something that sparked your imagination to go, hey, I, I can go with that. I can build from there and I can do this and I can do that. And then next thing you know, you got a freaking a best-selling novel. And that's what you do, guys, like you do. I do it too with my books. You know, every, every one of my books is something sparked an idea in my mind and then I just grew it. You know, I cultivated it and I, you know, I just kept writing. 
Mm -hmm. anyway, so everybody make sure to tune in. Hopefully this time next week we'll have another show to put out and um, we'll decide what that show will be about. But I think, uh, I mean, I do like the idea of aliens in, in black holes. I like to, maybe we could do a little research and kind of theorize or really speculate on what the scientists are saying and are telling us black holes are and what's the ultimate outcome for the universe. That'd be kind of cool. Uh, sure. Yeah. Or whatever you want to do. I'm I'm down with it all. You guys, make sure to check out Anthony's book. Read book one, Dragonstorm, the gate, or just gates, Dragonstorm gate. gate. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, I'll put the link on the bottom here. And uh, you once you read one, you're going to want to read two, Abracadabra, which is his new novel. It just came out on audiobook volume two. Yeah, and the volume one's on audiobook two. I'll put the link in the show notes too. So you can, you know, if you're an audio guy, a lot of people are. I am. So make sure to check out his book and check out my books too. I mean, I don't, uh, my books are about a mafia family, fictional mafia family set in Detroit, kind of contemporary. But if you like that type of thing, you're a reader, trust me, you'll like it. People are comparing it to The Godfather all the time. They say I wrote the next Godfather or the greatest mafia story ever told. People say it. Like, read Absolutely. Read it. So make sure to check out his stuff and his website. What's your website again? Uh, Dragonstorm novel, um, dot com, and that's pretty much everything Facebook and uh, and um, um, you know, Instagram, same way. And then the uh, Abraca, Abraca Dragon site is how you get to the contest, but you'll post a link to that. So, and then once you join, the, once you try to contest, you'll go on the mailing list, you'll know each month when in a, a new uh, riddle gets posted. And I'll do this for this is just so you know, his book is interactive, so that's one of the things that make it so cool why it's doing so well. Is as you're reading, there's like, um, you know, clues and things in the book that, that reference websites. Then you can actually go to the website to find the clue, which will help you kind of figure out the story where it's going. It's you know interactive. It's like it's like literary geocaching. It's super cool. So that's a really fun part of reading this book. So make sure you check it out and check out his website. Kind of what I want you to do with the with the with the riddles too. They're not they're not easy. So it's okay to use Google. I'm actually making them hard on purpose because I want you to do that research yeah. and you know, get out there and do a little, you know, you'll end up finding more things you didn't know about while you're doing yeah, the research. So exactly. And you got a What a freaking badass gift this for this next one, man. This, this coin rare coin from the, the, uh, the, um, the crusades Christian crusaders. Yeah. They couldn't spend any money. So they made their own money and it can't be allowed. So this is not a replica. This is a real, no, this is a real coin. You'll get a certificate of authenticity with, uh, with the coin. Yeah. And I think there's something that comes with the, uh, with the moth with, Patrick Crown won. Mention him again. Patrick Crown won the moth. Yeah, Patrick Crown, well done. Keep up the good work, buddy. Enjoy the, the gift. And um, that's super badass gift. And also, uh, you guys, he's got merch available at his website. So when you if you go buy and like order his book from him, from his website, you get signed book. He'll send you like a t-shirt. He's got cups, got all kinds of merch. He'll hook you up. So when you go there, make sure to, you know, grab a signed book, you know, and get some merch and rep the brand. It's dope. I'm waiting Thanks. for my new shirt. Thank you. I spilled gas on mine, so it's kind of stained, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, I, I need another one. I, I get I you two. more. I get you more. Yeah, I just need one. I, I, I like the really like the black one because that way, if I get a stain on it, you can't see. But then I was out there uh, working on my some oh my uh, power washer and it spilled gas because hot. I threw it on the ground. Gas spilled. Boom. Now it's like stained. Like, what effort, man? This thing is. Yeah, I got. I have two, two new ones that are black with the new book, so I get you those. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Of course. Everybody else, stay tuned. Uh, we'll see you next week on the next show. God bless. I hope you enjoyed. Make sure to leave a comment, like, share. Tell your friends if they like this type of content, to subscribe to our channel and enjoy. It's all we're just kind of here to have a little fun and kind of maybe have, you know, some interesting conversations about some interesting things that most people don't talk about much, but nerds like us do. So hopefully you had fun joining us and God bless and have a great week. We out. Yeah. So now...